Thanks, John. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to have you with us. Hopefully you were able to join us for the earlier session where there was in-depth discussion related to the provider relief funds and the environment that you're all operating in today. Um, there is a slide up right now, the welcome slide that has a bit of housekeeping on it. If you were at the last session, you know, just as John mentioned, um, please ask your questions in the chat. If you have any technical difficulties, also please send those through the chat and um, request questions of all panelists. And um, with that, we'll get started with our discussion over the next hour or so. Um, as John mentioned, I am Amy Josek. I'm a partner here at Bonavio in our healthcare group. And John and I work with a variety of healthcare systems, hospitals specifically. You are in the hospital breakout session. So if you intended to go to the FQHC session, you're in the wrong session. <laughs> and I don't know how to help you, but um, from looking at the attendee list, it does look like uh, many of you are part of hospital systems, so we're very glad to have you here today. <clears throat> Our discussion over the next hour will be regarding financial reporting and single audits as it relates to some of the funding that you've received as hospitals over the last nine months or so. Um, <clears throat> we'll focus primarily on the Provider Relief Fund, and John and Margaret did a great job earlier today summarizing the specifics of compliance and what we know as of today, December 11th, uh, for the Provider Relief Fund. The discussion over the next hour will be more focused on how to account for it and why, considerations related to financial reporting, and um, also considerations related to single audits or compliance audits. Before I get started, I'm reminded I need to put the disclaimer screen up here today, um, the presentation materials within, and that will be distributed at a later time are the views of John and I, um, of course, non-authoritative. So that's our disclaimer. And with that, we can get started. We'll start right off with a polling question. Make sure you're still awake after hopefully you're able to grab some food. And uh, hey, Amy, Amy, I think we jumped, someone jumped slides. What's that? I think we jumped a couple of slides. Hmm? Will we be on slide six? I'm on. Uh, no, I think I'm good. I started right with a polling question. Uh, I think we're good. Okay. And John is gracious enough to manage the poll. Just all right. So polling question, polling question number one. Where did it go? Did your organization adopt ASU 2018-8, 2018-18 clarifying scope and accounting guidance for contributions received? Contributions made in the past year, A, yes or no? Amy came right out of the gate with a very, <laughs> very technical term, but, but it, it lays the groundwork for what, what she's talking about. Yes, I just wanted to get a feel for our audience today. And actually, it should be 2018-08, apologies, but it is 2018-08, um, the new ASU regarding contributions and grants. And while you, you um, answer that polling question, I did want to start the discussion today with consideration of this ASU. Um, hospital systems may or may not have had to consider this. It's a new ASU required to be adopted by most systems and organizations, nonprofit organizations last year. And it really um, is a standard that was issued to be a companion standard for, I can get my screen here a companion standard for the revenue recognition standard. So ASC 606 was revenue from contracts with customers. Many organizations did adopt that standard prior to the pandemic. Of course, the pandemic occurred and the FASB offered a delay for organizations that hadn't adopted ASC 606. But that's not the um, intention of our conversation today. Really, we wanted to discuss the details of this ASU 2018-08 because we believe that this is the accounting standard that will govern your accounting for the provider relief fund. So if we peel back the onion a bit and think about ASU 2018-08, I mentioned it was a companion standard to the revenue recognition standard for contracts with customers. And the reason that we believe the FASB issued this standard, which really is a clarification, is because when you consider government grants that were received in the past and general contributions, so if you have a foundation with your hospital, you're accustomed to receiving contributions from donors, but uh, nonprofit organizations receive revenue and record revenue that are not exchange transactions under the definition of ASD 606. 
ASC 606, of course, as we know and we've talked about for many years, has a concept of being, needing to meet a performance obligation, which um, is, it incorporates an element of exchange, but nonprofit organizations also recognize revenue in non-exchange transactions. So the fancy thought that they needed to clarify the accounting really to be able to remove contributions and grants from ASC 606 and offer a framework for accounting for them um, under this new standard. So uh, six of the, the new standard, the 2018-08 standard, introduced a couple of new terminologies and new words, really. Um, <clears throat> the first is this concept of commensurate value. So when considering funding that's being received by your organization, when you're doing the smell test to determine if you fall into revenue recognition under contracts with customers or under this ASU 2018-08, um, are, are both, is there an exchange of commensurate value? And if you consider contributions and governmental grants, in the past, some organizations recognized revenue and when you're analyzing how much revenue to recognize, you might say, well, we've provided value to the general public. The public's receiving a benefit. So as I receive those governmental funds and I use them um, as, as they were intended for the, the benefit of the government, it's some type of an exchange transaction. So therefore, I'm going to recognize revenue as I earn it under the old terminology. Um, under this new standard, uh, this concept of commensurate value, if there is no exchange between the government and the entity that's receiving um, those funds, then it does not meet the definition of an exchange transaction. So in our mind, the provider relief funds would fall very nicely into this standard because there is not an exchange. The government is giving funds to your organization. The government is not directly receiving anything in return. Um, so it does fit in this ASU 2018-08. It does not fit in ASC 606, where, where we're talking about exchange transactions. And then the other concept that was introduced, and it's not really new, but the new standard introduces uh, this term terminology of conditions. And they define this terminology of conditions that you must meet in order to recognize revenue by saying that you, if there's a barrier in the agreement or in the terms from the government, and there's a right of return or release, then therefore you do not recognize revenue until you overcome that barrier and meet those conditions. So that's not unusual if, again, you're used to accounting for donor contributions. In the past, perhaps there were conditional type pledges that might have been received in the old accounting standards, and they remain the accounting standards would say, you don't recognize revenue until you overcome those conditions. And to the extent that you have these conditional gifts, then you need to disclose them as their material. So that remains the same, but this new ASU has, um, has really brought government grants underneath the wing of, of contributions. And so that's how we're looking at them now. When organizations adopted the standard, uh, there wasn't a significant change in the dollars that were actually recognized as revenue, but the way that we like to look at it as auditors is the reason why you're recognizing this revenue is different now. You're recognizing it under a different framework, although the dollars that you get to will probably be similar. So when considering the, the concept of the condition, and again, you have to have a barrier and the right of return of release. So what's in place um, that would not allow you to um, recognize this revenue? And in a couple of the FASB webinars that I've attended over the last year or so, the concept that they bring up that I thought made things more clear to me when considering barriers and when do I overcome barriers and can recognize revenue is really considering what of the funding you've received from the government is at risk. So if you think about the discussion that John and Margaret had earlier, there, <laughs> there's pages and pages of terms and, con terms and conditions, FAQs, um, post payment guidance has been published for the provider relief funds. And um, we're not going to get into the weeds of those as much as John and Margaret did earlier, but to the extent that you don't meet those terms and conditions, you don't have eligible expenditures, um, or you don't have the lost revenue, then what's that risk of return? And so that helps to be, I guess, our guiding light when we consider um, what can be recognized as revenue for your fiscal year end. And I know many organizations are looking for a calendar year end, a 1231 year end. So if you need to consider what to recognize in that time period, you need to consider what would be at risk 
of return. And of course, that would not be recognized as revenue. John, I'm curious, do you have the polling results? I'm not even sorry, I don't mean to put you on the you spot. Do, you do get me really. Uh, um, <laughs> I'll swing back to so, you. Yes, I, I have them. So of the eight responses, 75% said they adopted okay. 2018-08. So maybe the two that said no um, probably took it literally with, with, with the typo we have for 18. <laughs> <2018. laughs> True. Or you know, many hospitals may not have had to consider these in the past because you have not had material governmental funding or material contributions. Maybe you're not working with the accounting for your foundation. So it wouldn't surprise me if 2018-08 really wasn't a consideration until this year when you're receiving a significant amount of governmental funding. <clears throat> so the next slide is actually very small, so you probably can't see it, but this is a flow chart that we've used in our presentations at Bonadio to give you um, a yes and no flow of whether or not you fall under um, ASU 2018-08, so this concept of an exchange transaction or a contribution. And then the next step is, is this conditional or not? And if so, what are the conditions? What are the barriers? Is there a right of return or release? And then that will drive when you can recognize revenue. So it's a handy little flow chart, um, again, to help walk you through those first initial questions. So now we've established that this funding, the provider relief funds, would be recognized under ASU 2018-08. Um, certainly, there are barriers in place, as I've mentioned. Um, John and Margaret went into much more detail. So, again, when you're considering as of your year end, what can we recognize as revenue? You have to, and, and again, some of the um, terms and criteria under the provider relief funds are still being uh, finalized or clarified, I should say. And I know Margaret and John had spoke to a lot of questions that have come up over the last month or two, and we don't have answers for some of them. So if you're trying to come up with a calculation to support the revenue you're planning to recognize as of December 31st, it seems that it's still fluid. Uh, I, you know, this gets away from financial reporting, but we do believe that once the reporting portal is open, that they will hopefully clarify some of the questions that we have that may change your calculation when you're trying to aggregate your expenses or to calculate the lost revenue year over year. But in short, when you're considering accounting for these, once we have a, a firm understanding of all of the regulations and you're, you're compiling your 1231 financial statements, you need to determine what barriers have we overcome, what expenses have we incurred, that's a barrier to overcome, do we have lost revenue for 2020? That's a barrier to overcome. Have we done what we needed to do um, in order to overcome any other types of barriers? And if so, then you've overcome those barriers, the revenue is not at risk of return, and you are able to recognize that revenue. So um, John actually attended the AICPA's healthcare conference, I believe it was last week, and they brought up an interesting um, discussion because of the provider relief funds measurement period being a calendar year. So to the extent that there is any financial reporting that needs to be performed on an, a fiscal year that's not a calendar year, what do we do? Um, because when you consider the barrier to overcome, the barrier is, um, particularly for the lost revenue piece, um, it's an aggregation of the entire 2020 calendar year. So, for example, if your reporting period or your year end is September 30th and you're trying to evaluate the revenue to recognize as of September 30th, you aggregate your expenses as of September 30th, that seems pretty reasonable, but the concept of lost revenue, you do add up, let's say, the first three quarters of 2020 um, to calculate the revenue loss, but then, um, understanding the requirements of HHS, uh, that fourth quarter in 2020 could bear upon what you've calculated for the three quarters ending September 30th. And so that's a consideration that needs to be made when you're calculating the revenue for a time period that doesn't match the measurement period for HHS. And it was interesting in this AICPA conference because again, we're, we're, we're relying on and leaning upon ASU 2018-08 to recognize this grant revenue, but ASU 2018-08 does not really give any um, guidance for variable variable considerations, so considerations 
revenue that could be subject to change. And so the um, presenters at the conference discussed the fact that when <clears throat> guidance does not exist for this particular um, instance, then it's reasonable to add a lot um, to analogize the uh, situation with other existing guidance. And so they drew, drew upon ASC 606, revenue from contracts with customers, which you've um, adopted that standard, you know that there is discussion of variable compensation or variable consideration uh, in that standard. So in this instance where perhaps you do have an off-year reporting that you'd want to determine, okay, we can calculate what we know as of 9-30-2020, but we know that perhaps whatever occurred in that last quarter, calendar year, can bear upon the total amount of income that we should be recognizing um, because, you know, perhaps you actually had a gain in, in the fourth quarter um, when you calculate the HHS's reporting requirement. Um, <clears throat> so they did say that it, it would be reasonable to use other uh, guidance that's out there in the absence of specific discussion in this standard. And the, the variable consideration discussion in ASC 606 does mention that um, you would constrain your revenue. So if something happens after year end that would bear upon what you've already calculated um, as of 930 in this example, then you would actually adjust that, constrain your revenue, reduce it um, for the 930 reporting period. Amy, I, well, I got a full question, so I'll launch the poll and then I'll, I'll add my uh, commentary. Um, did your Oh, sorry. Amy made me go back. Um, poll number question number two. Will your organization recognize all the HHS cash received as revenue before 123120? So you remember in the first session I asked, do you think you'll eventually recognize all the revenue? I mean, sorry, use up and expend all the cash you receive. Now we're talking about it from the, from the accounting position. Um, will you actually recognize it as revenue? Um, what, what I was going to, to add to it is Amy was given the example of a fiscal year end at 930 and what you're going to do by 1231, I think the, the other item, as we talked about earlier, your reporting period can be extended all the way through 630, 2021. So I, I can look at the attendees right now, and, and I know the majority of you are fiscally, I'm sorry, are calendar year ends. I do see a couple of fiscal year ends at 630. But you will need to think, what is my revenue recognition based off of what could happen over the next six months if I extend out. And as Amy said, you need to, to, to analogize what 606 said, which is constraint. Or think about, should I really be recognizing all of this as revenue, or should some of it stay, stay in a reserve? Thanks, John. And I'm curious if you have enough polling responses at this point to uh, offer a percentage, yes, yes no. <laughs> um, well, I have eight responses, which is consistent with the previous response, um, but we have three yes, zero no's, five unknown. So <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad from, from our previous uh, presentation and then you talking then that we are definitely going around the land of confusion or, or if it's just, hey, I got three weeks left, I haven't really had a chance to think about this. I guess that's not surprising. I, I initially, with the polling question, offered a yes, no, and I said I should probably put an unsure because with the changing guidance, um, I think that a lot of organizations are in that position as we're looking ahead. So, okay, so this slide um, covers what I just previously spoke to when the standard does not speak to the variable consideration, it's reasonable to look to ASC 606. And to the extent that you do believe that there's something that's occurred in this measurement period for the provider relief fund um, as defined by the regulators, then you would constrain the revenue that you're recognizing at that interim period, the period that doesn't match the measurement period um, from HHS. And you know, as auditors, we say that disclosure is important. Um, transparent disclosure enables users to understand judgments and draw meaningful conclusions about those financial statements. So, um, I'm sure that um, your organizations are going to have some type of disclosure regarding the pandemic, um, disclosure regarding the accounting and policies for reporting these funds in your financial statements. <clears throat> Moving to presentation in the financial statements, um, the standard we're talking about, ASU 2018-08, which is 
ASC 958-605 codified. Um, when you're accounting for grant income, you do present it on a gross basis. You don't net it with the, the related expenses. So I think that's consistent with what most organizations are expecting to do. And then um, there's this question of, do we record these provider relief funds in operating income or as a component of non-operating income? And again, there was a discussion of this at the AICPA Healthcare Conference. Of course, a variety of healthcare systems participate in that conference. Um, but um, often, most often with our client base, we're finding that it would be recorded as operating income. Um, and the perhaps sniff test of the track is, um, is this funding considered related to the healthcare provider's ongoing major or central operations? And to the extent that organizations typically do receive governmental funding, and you do through Medicaid and Medicare, um, most often, it seems that organizations would record this as a component of operations. Now, for those organizations that cannot um, indicate that they've overcome barriers as of the end of their fiscal year, um, however, they've received these provider relief funds in cash, of course, that excess that, that you can't recognize in, as revenue would be recorded as deferred revenue as a, a component of your balance sheet um, to the extent that you are um, presenting a classified balance sheet, you need to consider if there's pieces that should be in current or in non-current. Uh, the AACPA actually did put out an interesting um, non-authoritative uh, technical, technical questions and answers publication um, specific to, health, to hospital entities. So I've added the link here, um, and when you receive a copy of your materials, then please feel free to read that. Discusses accounting for the provider release fund and some presentation considerations. I'm going to check the chat real quick here. See if there's any questions coming in, nothing so far. Yeah. Great. I'll, I'll say, as far as the chat and questions coming in, uh, we do have a much smaller group. I think all those names, I, I know every, every, every person on, on that list I've talked to at least once, if not multiple times. So just feel free to. Feel free to ask the questions if Amy and I don't have the answer right now, or, or it's just too too specific to your organization. We will reach out to you offline. Yes, thank you, John. Okay, so I did just want to comment on a couple of other situations you may find yourself in as a hospital system um, outside of the provider relief fund. So, of course, the CARES Act um, offered the ability to receive accelerated advanced Medicare payments. Um, when you consider this and you're recording this, um, I think it's pretty straightforward, but just wanted to walk through this. So this is recording revenue under 606, so not the grants and contributions standard, but this is truly the revenue from contracts with customer standards because, of course, it's an advanced payment of your patient service revenue. Um, so your performance obligation has not yet been met, met, but you've received the cash, so you'd record that as deferred revenue or contract liability. Um, under the revenue recognition standards, there's certain disclosures required when you have a contract liability. So you'll want to be considering those in your footnotes to the financial statements. Um, something that was interesting um, that I heard at the AICPA conference was, um, so generally deferred revenue because you're expecting to earn it. You're going to earn it over your next year. Um, but to the extent for some reason, and it would be a unique situation, I would think, that you've received this cash in advance and you don't expect that you will be able to earn it um, over the next year or at ever, then when you're recording this liability, instead of being deferred revenue, it's actually a refund liability because you will have to uh, repay it. And again, if you offer a classified balance sheet um, in your financial statements, then you'll need to consider the current versus long term. And that could get a little bit complicated because it's, you know, it has, as of now, um, expect it to be repaid through your future uh, reimbursement and billing. So you have to do some sort of an estimate to understand um, what piece would be considered short-term versus long-term. And I've also, I don't have the link here, um, but there's another AICPA Techno Questions and Answers bulletin that was issued that speaks specifically to um, the advanced and accelerated payment. A couple other things that we're seeing um, as in our travels as we work with our hospitals, of course, deferred payroll taxes, you know, not complicated to record those as a liability. 
Again, consider your current and long-term portions on a classified balance sheet and in your disclosures. And then John and Margaret have already spoken to this, but um, HHS itself, of course, has said that they're the, the payer of last resort. FEMA has said the same, but when it comes to accounting, and John alluded to this as well, um, you can't use the same barriers or the same expenses to satisfy barriers under different funding streams. So to the extent that you're using the dollar that you paid someone to um, apply for forgiveness for a PPP loan, you can't then go back and use that same dollar to satisfy the barriers under HHS funding. That's this whole double dipping concept because of course, um, just conceptually, you'll be then recognizing revenue twice, you're double dipping, you're not allowed to use that same dollar to overcome two different barriers in these situations. Okay, another polling question already. All right, did your organization receive under 750,000 in stimulus funds over 700 or, or over 750,000 in stimulus funds? And it's gonna set the table um, for the, the, the next question. And while we kind of wait for some of the, I'm sorry, not the next question, the, the, the next part of the presentation, while we wait for that to come in, um, come in and as Amy was talking about, multi, you know, there's, there's more than just the provider relief funds, there's more than just PPP, and it is a little bit of a humble brag, but one of our partners went through and created a 58-page document based on what types of uh, COVID and CARE, sorry, CARE Act seamless funds, and if you answer yes, additional questions will, will um, flow through. For the bond deal clients, you can expect that's something we're going to be doing during the audit. If you're a non-client and just really interested, like I said earlier, I know all of you. Um, feel free just to reach out to myself or Amy, and we'd be more than happy to work with you on that document. And John, we right. have a question come through the chat that I guess we should probably look at before we move on to single audit. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm kind of laughing because there's. This question came in, there's two people here that would, would be impacted. Maybe there's actually three three facilities that would be impacted. But it, but it relates to um, how do you meet the barriers on the cost report implications um, for cost reports completed, when is it possible? Um, I believe what we're getting at is essentially saying if I have CARES Act money and that CARES Act money is supposed to, to help with, um, that CARES Act money is going to flow up to my cost report, I think um, we're also going back to what Margaret and I talked about in the beginning is we don't know what the expenses are, we don't know what the reimbursements are. Um, how do I basically come over that liability and when are my barriers to overcome? Um, I'll, I'll reach out to the individual that asked that on, um, on Monday just to, to further clarify, but really what I would say, especially with cost-based reimbursement and say, well, some of this is changing, where am I? I know two of the facilities I work with throughout the peer, th throughout the year, on a quarter, at least on a quarterly basis, you are doing interim cost reports and, and you should be using your best guess. Um, I look kind of like, well, just because we have COVID, or I'm sorry, we have CARES Act funds and provider relief funds, really when you're cost-based reimbursed, it is kind of a, what comes first, the chicken or the egg um, for, for these critical access hospitals. Do you need your audited financial statements done and all your expenses done, or do I need the cost report to know what the, re the, the revenue is? And there's that, there is that whole estimate and what's being constrained and what, and, and what you're going to hold back. So, so I'll follow up with that, that person specifically um, to, to further elaborate that question with them. Yeah, and John, I think it really does speak to the clarification needed because I know you and Margaret spoke earlier to the fact that there was an FAQ that was released from HHS that talked about um, the, uh, the uh, qualifying expenses and do they need to be reduced by um, funding that's already been re reimbursed. And I think that that's still clear, unclear. So the question that was asked um, is asking about there are cost report implications and since cost reports aren't completed until after financials are issued, is there going to be any adjustment that needs to be made to the HHS revenue that's being recognized, or, or is that more of a side implication and a secondary liability? And I would say that the first question is, okay, what is the barrier? And that's the question that I think we're still unclear on in some ways, because we're waiting for the HHS guidance to be clarified to really define the barrier. Is the barrier 
pure just expenses, eligible expenses, or is there something that needs to be applied against expenses to reduce those eligible expenses because you've been reimbursed through another source such as Medicaid or Medicare? So that's more of the um, uh, question on the HHS requirement side of things. And then once that barrier is defined, I think it, when you look at the revenue recognition for your HHS funding, again, you need your barrier to be defined, then um, the revenue recognition that follows can be straightforward. And to the extent that you do need to reduce your expenses, and this is just purely um, hypothetical, but if your eligible expenses do need to be reduced in some way because you're being reimbursed in another manner, then you would have to consider that in your calculation for revenue. Um, and then I think your question is good. Um, the individual asked the question, how does this play into your third party liability estimates for the end of the year? And I do think that is a separate conversation. Um, of course, when healthcare organizations are considering their exposure when it comes to their third party payers, um, is there something that needs to be estimated um, from a reserve perspective at the end of the year? So that's a great, a great question. Not a very direct answer, <laughs> only because of the uncertainty that currently exists. Uh, John, do you have a, a polling question answers by any chance? I did. Um, where did they go? Nine out of 14 that responded um, said they had received over $750,000 in stimulus funds. Great. Well, um, so the next discussion point for our conversation today is think a lot of consideration. So those of you who answered that you've received over 750 to the extent that you have expended that 750, and you know that's a definition we'll speak to in a few minutes. Um, you are going to be the fortunate recipient of a single audit. Um, and our, our intention over the next few slides, actually the next seven slides, are somewhat of a summary and background of single audit requirements. Um, I know some of the organizations that we work with are accustomed to having a single audit performed, and some this may be the first one in a very long time. So we thought it would be beneficial to at least provide you the information on the slide. They'll go through each one very, very quickly, just as a refresher, and then speak to this group about some updates that we have as it relates to um, what to expect for the single audits for the 2020 calendar year end and some of the fiscal year considerations. <clears throat> so again, the first few slides just in background, so I won't read all the words here, but um, in recent years, some of the previous res regulations have been combined and when we consider what guides us and you from a compliance perspective, um, we refer to the set of rules that we follow as the uniform guidance, and that's in the last bullet right here. There's also a link here that um, is a link to the actual Office of Management and Budget, so that's the governmental agency that prescribes the audit requirements for you and also prescribes the audit procedures that we as auditors need to perform. Now, for each type of funding, federal funding, that is received, um, the OMB does set forth a compliance supplement. Perhaps not for every specific stream, and if it's not specified um, in what they consider their CFDA numbers, Catalog of Federal Domestic Assistance Number, and the Provider Relief Fund, since we're speaking about that um, today, certainly has a CFDA number, so um, to the extent that a federal stream of funding has a CFDA number, it, uh, the compliance supplement will guide the compliance requirements for that program in addition to other issued guidance. And it will also guide your auditors, of course, for the testing that they need to perform in a single audit. And we've, again, linked um, the compliance supplement that's been released in August. Um, so <clears throat> each year, a new com com compliance supplement is released, and we were excited on August 6th or around that date when the supplement was released because we were waiting to see um, what the federal government, the Office of Management and Budget, um, wanted us as auditors to test for all of this, these new funding streams, including the Provider Relief, but all of the CARES Act funding that um, many of our, our clients received. And we were disappointed when it was released because with that release came uh, the news that we now need to wait for an addendum. So they did issue the compliance supplement, but they really didn't prescribe the um, testing requirements for much of the new CARES Act funding. 
So we've been waiting. They've, they have, uh, they being the OMB has told us that it would be issued in the fall. And we're coming up very quickly on the end of fall per the calendar. Um, so we do hope that by Christmas that we will have received the addendum that will drive our testing for this new year, the 2020 year. And uh, when John and I were at the AACPA conference, they did have a presenter from the AACPA who actually had a draft of the addendum. So um, through our searching, we were not able to find that it was publicly available, but it was in a, in a good enough form that the OMB must have shared it with the AACPA, and they were able to share some of the updates that we can expect, and I'll share those with you today as well. So the 750 that I previously mentioned in the polling question, if your organization expends more than 750,000 in federal funds, so that's an aggregation of all of the federal expenditures that you um, have within the year. So um, it's not just the provider relief funds. You need, do need to um, compile all of the funding that you've received, and that would cause you to be required to have a single audit. So many of you that received over 750, um, in stimulus funds from the provider relief fund, we'd expect you'd have to have a single audit. It does focus on expenditures, so that's something that we do um, often have to help our clients work through. Just because you were paid the funding, just because you recognized revenue for the funding doesn't necessarily mean that you expended the funding. And the OMB does have guidance that helps to define what expending means. We won't go into the details of that today. Um, but there, that is a distinction, that it's not necessarily the revenue. Um, in the case of the Provider Relief Fund, it, it will be, um, it will match, but um, it's, it's the federal expenditures that really trip that threshold to require a single audit. Uh, I mentioned the CFDA numbers, so they have released the CFDA numbers for the Provider Relief Fund. We've provided them here on this slide. Some organizations may also have received funding under the second CFTA number, the Uninsured Testing and Treatment Reimbursement Payment. So when you're considering your federal funds that need to be reported and audited through the single audit process, you may have um, several different CFTA numbers through new, new funding received through the CARES Act as well as previous funding you may have received in the past. Um, again, this is a, a summary page. Uh, so the single audit is a compliance audit. It's not a test necessarily of the balances that are reported on your financial statements. It's a test of the federal expenditures that um, you as in your organization have expended for the year, and the government wants to make sure that you spent those in compliance with relevant guidance um, under the terms of your grant agreement. They also want to make sure that you have an adequate internal, construction, internal control structure in place. So through the financial statement audit, we're gaining an understanding of internal controls over financial reporting. How do the numbers that get to your financials, what internal controls do you have over those? But in addition to that, for the single audit, we are also gaining an understanding and testing how, what is your internal control structure over compliance items? Um, we had a very brief discussion, I know, on compliance related to telehealth from Evelyn earlier, but um, we as auditors don't normally need to get into the compliance for a non-single audit. Um, but for a single audit, we'll need to understand and test as prescribed by the OMB um, compliance considerations for these, these, the funding that you've received in the, in the current year. You actually issue a separate, we call it a CFA, Schedule of Expenditure of Federal Awards. It's in a very prescribed format um, that listed here. One thing that will be new for uh, CFA that includes COVID-related funding is that there's now a requirement that it has to be designated, but it has to say COVID funding in front of the program. You might recall years ago when we had the ERA funding, that that was another requirement. So that's coming back, so it's very easily identifiable, the funding that was received um, through COVID relief. But to the extent that we have findings, so single audit findings, it's very black and white. Um, if you do have an internal control finding that's a significant deficiency or material weakness, we're required to report it on a schedule of findings and questioned costs. Um, to the extent that you actually have um, funding that we find to be not allowable, and that's reportable as well on the schedule if it's over a certain dollar threshold. <clears throat> and I think I'm gonna be jumping the gun here, but um, just because it flows better, at the end of a single audit, all of the single audit reports 
which is the financial statements, the CFA, the schedule findings and questions costs, and your regular um, basic financial statements are all reported through the um, federal clearinghouse to the federal government. It's a, and we have a link later in the presentation, but it's publicly available. So if any organization in the last couple of years has had a single audit, anyone can go, look to see the results of um, their audit, look, can, look to see the federal funds that they've received or expended in that year. So it's much more visible, um, um, the, the single audit versus the financial statement audit. So if you think about preparing for a single audit, I just spoke to the testing that we need to do, the numbers and the internal controls and the compliance. And the thing that we often find is this concept of internal control over compliance is the area that's lacking. So it's different than um, perhaps just your financial reporting internal controls. It may be outside of the accounting and business office, depending on the program um, that you are um, conducting. So ensuring that you can demonstrate to the auditors that you actually have a system of internal controls over the compliance related to this program is gonna be very important. Now for the Provider Relief Fund, it's largely driven by um, expenditures. So the, the controls that you have in place over your cash disbursement cycle would also be dual purpose controls over compliance. Um, you'll just want to ensure, though, when you're aggregating and gathering your expenses and coming up with that number that you are going to be submitting for reimbursement, um, the extra step really is, okay, well, who's responsible for reviewing that reporting that needs to be made? Who's responsible for ensuring that, yes, these expenditures, sure, they're expenditures, we paid them, but that they're eligible to be reported under the terms of this program and this grant? Um, and there are a lot of requirements to consider, compliance requirements. Um, so, as you think of those, you'll want to consider what are our internal controls over ensuring that we are in compliance, not just that we are in compliance, but what are the controls to ensure that we're in compliance, because that's what the auditors will be looking for when they're conducting uh, the single audit. <clears throat> I won't go into great detail about our testing. We already discussed it um, at a high level. As auditors, we are required to follow certain standards as well, um, assessing risk of um, at the organization, assessing risk of the programs at the organization, and then, of course, performing our testing. Last poll question. Yes, the very last of 12 poll questions I will ask today. Has your organization obtained a single audit in the past, yes or no? Amy, is we're looking at some of the results um, Sometimes the polls might be a little bit skewed because we have three people internally, so that's probably why they didn't answer yes to the prior <laughs> four for a single audit, so. <laughs> that's all right. Okay, here's where I jumped the gun previously, talking about the reporting under the single audit. So, yes, we issue as auditors financial statements with opinions, um, with an opinion on uh, the internal control over financial statements and the compliance, as well as any findings that we found. That whole entire package, along with your basic financials, are submitted through um, what we call the data collection um, website, the federal website where all these forms are maintained. The website also has a prescribed format to enter. There's four or five screens that need to be completed to take the information from your CFA and your single audit and report it back in their prescribed format as well. It's generally due nine months after your year end. Um, as we think to the future, we can share a few things that are expected in the compliance supplement, including uh, expected extension of that deadline uh, for the single audit reporting. Something to keep in mind is, well, the single audit deadline is typically nine months after your end. Often your financial statements are still are um, completed well in advance of that, so you'll want to ensure that to the, and the auditors need to ensure that to the extent that you have, um, we're testing internal controls over financial reporting, if it affects the single audit, we'll need to make sure they have those communications and the timing aligned appropriately, the timing of our testing. So, Amy, of the, the nine respondees, six, um, six said that they, they have had a single audit in the past, three said no, and uh, one comment that the past is a very long time. <laughs> well, I'm sorry for those who have to go through their first single audit. 
Okay. Uh, so this slide was we took right out of the AICPA conference slide, and we thought it did a good job of showing the new funds, the new large programs that are going to be included in this addendum to the compliance supplement. The one we're focusing on, of course, is the Provider Relief Fund, $175 billion, very significant. The next largest, um, really, well, the largest is the PPP program. We were very relieved to hear that any funds received through the PPP program are not subject to single audit. So for your hospital organizations, if you received a PPP loan and provider relief funds, only the provider relief funds will be subject to single audit. Okay, so we mentioned you may have a first time single audit um, for 2020 or for 2021 or both. Um, this, the, the concept or the contemplation of auditing the provider relief fund is risky um, to auditees and to auditors because when, again, the compliance supplement and the addendum is expected to come out, when we heard from the AICPA, the expectation is that the, the addendum and requirements of auditors related to the provider relief fund will be largely driven by the guidance that's already been issued. <laughs> So I can understand why it's taking them a while to issue this addendum because the guidance seems to not be clear or is changing. But what um, the AICPA communicated to us to expect is that it's not going to be this very, very clear audit plan and, and set of requirements that's laid out in a thick document for us to follow as auditors and for you to follow as the auditee. Really, they're going to reference those terms and conditions, um, the previously issued notices, FAQs that are out there. So um, this creates risk. It's, an, it's a unique program and that it's not well established. It's new. Um, it's subject to um, a lot of interpretation at this point. Um, so it will be an, an interesting year for single audit for the provider relief fund. Um, this information, I have a disclaimer on the side because uh, it, this was derived from the AACPA conference and it was based on a draft of the addendum. Um, for most of us on this call, the most significant addition, of course, is we're waiting for information on the Provider Relief Fund um, single audit testing. So the other thing that was interesting was that they mentioned at the conference, again, this is disclaimer based on the draft addendum, that fiscal years ending 12-31-20, yes, you're going to need to have your fund single, um, you're going to have to have a single audit if you are over that 100, 750000 They did say that any um, year end prior to December 30th, 2020, would not be subject to a single audit for their fiscal 20 year end. So 630, 930 um, year ends would not report on their schedule of expenditures of federal awards, any funding received in that year, they would not be required to have a single audit. Rather, they would include those funds on their next fiscal year single audit. So that was interesting and almost a relief because for those fiscal year organizations that have already perhaps completed their financial statement audit, we're kind of just pending. Do we need to keep looking back to fiscal 20 for the next, who knows, three or four or five, six months, and then undergo a single audit? Um, of course, you'll still need to over undergo the single audit. At the end of the day, HHS is going to want to see those federal expenditures reported somewhere and tested somewhere. But at least based on the draft addendum, it seems that those funds actually will be reported on your next fiscal year's CFA. So it will create a difference between what you've reported for gap purposes, financial statement purposes, and what you're reporting on your schedule of expenditures or federal awards. So I thought that was interesting to share. So we'll see when the addendum is finally issued if that holds true. Let's see. And, and I did mention that um, the compliance audit testing is really expected to be pulled from various sources. It's not going to be very, very clear. It's going to be referring us as auditors and you as auditees to many different, um, different websites and FAQs that have already been released. So this is expected to be a bit challenging and not as smooth as perhaps we would all like it to be. There was also an expected extension of the single audit due date. So I mentioned that nine month period. Um, seems that yes, we're certainly finding everything is extended this year. So we'll see, they didn't give an actual date that they thought that the extension would um, be pushed out to. And the last thing I noted um, 
is that the reporting for the FIFA, as I mentioned, on the data collection program we need to actually designate the funding from COVID relief. So you'll see that very clearly in the FIFA and the data collection form. Okay, well, that is um, the conclusion of our discussion today. I will look back through the chat to see if there are any more yep. questions. If we, we, we had one more come in, and I, it, it was directed to me um, specifically to their situation, but I, I think I can generalize it because the question is, um, and the theme of today really is, you know, the year ends coming up, and Amy's saying, mo, mo, uh, six, six of you, at least on this call today, or overwhelming majority, will need a single audit. When is that going to be done? Will it be done as part of my audit? Uh, when is it due? Um, can I have the same audit team? And, you know, the response is we want this compliance supplement to come out. We want to see what needs to be tested as far as compliance um, related to these provider relief funds. Um, the, the hope is, you know, that a firm like ours or, or many top CPA firms, they're familiar with single audits. Um, we, we know how to get them done. Um, but also we do need to know what we're actually going, going to be testing. So, so it is another thing to put on your plate. Um, Amy's slides such as, you really gotta have that culture of compliance. That's just another thing on your plate to say, how are we complying with, with these provider relief funds for the purpose of a, sing, uh, of a single audit? And, and you know, Amy and I also work in the higher ed um, side of the industry as well. And we can tell you that, that you know, they, they are fiscal year end, they're 630. And we still don't, we do not have their compliance supplement yet, so we've been holding their single audits open. Um, we anticipated what we believe the tests were going to be. We, we, this isn't our first rodeo. We've done this before. But ultimately, until we know, we can't finish that report um, until the compliance supplement comes, up, comes out. Yes. And I do see um, not one more question. It says, what if the funds were used to pay off a loan from another entity, a different tax ID, but the same system. So I have to apologize because I'm not sure what part of our discussion that might have stemmed from. Yeah. But uh, I, yep, I, I, uh, it didn't come to me or I'm not seeing it, but but I will, uh, um, I believe I know who that is and I'll, I'll, I'll address it with her because that, that oh, Amy, did you, oh, that is a very specific question and it's something I've been thinking <laughs> about this week especially as an update to the provider relief funds uh, came out, one of the clarifications this week. So I will speak, I will set up a phone call with that person. Okay. Well, if it's not the person that John thinks it is, because it actually came through our training coordinator, so we can't see who it is, we have our contact information here on this page. We know all of you, so you know how to get a hold of us. Um, so if you'd like to follow up, you know, like John mentioned at this discussion in the previous, we're here, we'd like to talk about this. We're spending time, of course, and investing efforts and ensuring that we understand it so that we can pass it on to you. So I don't see any more questions. There are no more polls. We have about five minutes to spare. Hopefully that gives you five minutes back on your Friday afternoon. Um, we really do appreciate all of you attending the session today, and we do hope you find, found it helpful. Um, and if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to contact us. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was, it was a long two sessions combined, but we appreciate it. So hope you have a wonderful holiday season.